The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Cambers offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Cambers also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours and hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5, just half an hour before closing time. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10.
Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behavior and capabilities, but here at the park, we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide nine meters in height and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium with 16 carts, eight for single drivers and eight for kids preferring to ride along with mom, dad or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One-style carts but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 meters because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an introductory talk to a health club. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Rose's Health Club, which is part of the nationwide Rose Group of Health and Fitness Centres. Today, I hope to tell you everything about the Glenfield Centre and the facilities it offers. First, have a look at the map of the centre I have put up here. There's a copy of it in your information packs. As you can see, we have a range of facilities. We are here at the meeting point, next to the reception desk. If you get lost, which is unlikely, make your way here. The main feature of the health club is, of course, the swimming pool. This is a 25-metre pool divided into three or four lanes. Access to the pool is normally through the changing rooms, for obvious reasons. 
To get to these, bear left as you come through reception, and as you follow the corridor, they are the two doors immediately to your right. First the female changing room, then the men's. If you follow the corridor right to the back of the building, you'll find one of our most popular features, three state-of-the-art squash courts. We keep them in very good condition, so if you're keen on that sport, I'm sure you'll appreciate the quality. Right then, I'm sure what many of you are thinking of joining for is access to the gym facilities and activities like yoga. We've got lots of space for this, and these are all situated on the left-hand side of the main corridor, opposite the changing rooms and squash courts. At the far end, you'll find the fixed and free weights room. There are lots of fixed weights machines, and you'll also find exercise bikes and rowing machines. Next to that, directly opposite the changing rooms, there's access to our sports hall. This is where yoga classes, martial arts, circuit training and other classes take place. We even have badminton and table tennis sometimes. OK, moving on from the sports, there are two other things to point out. One is a small door next to reception to the left as you come in. This takes you into the staff training room. This is important because you'll know where to find us in an emergency and it doubles as a first aid room in those circumstances. Finally, last but not least, there is another corridor to the right as you come in and that leads you to the cafe lounge on one side and the viewing area for the swimming pool on the other. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Now, we will go for a little tour in a moment, but first I'd like to tell you a little about the different kinds of club membership we have, so that you can be thinking about what you want as we go round. We, first of all, have the Anytime membership. Anytime is the complete go-as-you-please membership. This entitles you to full use of all the facilities during all opening hours. And we're open every day from 5am till midnight. This costs £850 per year, though there are some discounts which I will tell you about in a moment. Don't forget that the Rose Group is a nationwide group and this membership also entitles you to the full use of the group's other 250 clubs around the country. The free time membership is an off-peak membership. This entitles you to use of the facilities between 10am in the morning and 3pm in the afternoon. Also, you can use the facilities at any time at weekends. This costs £500. Note that you will still have access to a personal trainer under this membership scheme. Finally, a standard membership costs £400 and is a weekday membership, really, especially suitable for retired people who can come during the week. There is also a children's membership scheme. Children can join this scheme if they are between 15 and 18 years old. Please note that children of less than 15 can't come to the club without an adult and they can't take sessions on the sunbed. Not that young people usually want to use a sunbed anyway. The children's schemes are all half price, that is 50% for each child or young person in the scheme. People who live outside the area can have a discount of up to 50%, but this has to be arranged specially with the general manager. If that is of interest to any of you, let me know and I will fix up an appointment for you. 
Now, let's go on our tour. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear the rest of the talk about family history. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, that's a few ideas about getting information, but what about methods of recording it? Of course, you can just write down what family members say, but it's even better if you can use a tape, so that you can record them as they're talking. Then you don't have to worry too much about making mistakes. You'll always be able to listen to it again. But whatever method you do use to record information, remember that it's very important to make a note of exactly how you got it. So, if you are using tape, always start the recording by saying the date and the place, as well as the name of the person you're interviewing. So, apart from people's memories... Where else can you find information? Well, there are all sorts of documents, and they can be extremely useful. People keep lots of kinds of documents in the home, like uh, photos or letters or diaries or birth certificates. And some people keep things from newspapers, like obituaries. Obituaries are announcements of a person's death and they usually contain a lot of detail about that individual, like address, occupation, date of death, as well as the names and ages of the widow or widower and the dead person's children. So, be creative. Look around your home or the home of your relatives for any items that might contain clues, such as these about your family history. OK? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, you'll find that you'll collect a lot of information, so you'll need to record it in an organised way. I'd recommend that you use an ancestor chart, uh, like this one here. <laughs> Can you all see? Yeah. Ancestor charts act like maps. They link four or five generations in a family tree, so they're very convenient, and they don't cost anything. You can get as many as you like, you just download them free from the internet. Then you fill them out as you go along, and for each individual you record all the key information next to their full name. <laughs> it's very convenient. Now, at this point, I'd just like to give you a couple of tips about filling in the ancestor sheet. First of all, 
I'd advise you to use pencil, at least until you have definite evidence for the information you're recording. Secondly, as well as recording official names, I mean given names, it's worth writing any nicknames down. You know, these are the short names that people call you when they know you very well. And you can show them by using quotation marks. That's ancestor charts, then. They really do save a lot of work. Now, before I show you how to go about confirming the information you've collected... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Today I'm going to talk about my end of year project. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today, I'm going to talk about my end-of-year project. I wanted to find out why men and women tend to perform at different levels in particular sports. Let me start by explaining why I chose this subject. Now, as some of you may know, I'm an enthusiastic long-distance runner myself, but I have never felt particularly worried about the fact that I usually finish several minutes behind my male counterparts. How it all started was when a first-year student approached me because he'd read an article about why women swimmers never compete successfully with men and wondered if I could look into the issue in regard to running. My tutor confirmed that a lot of interesting research had been done on this issue, and also I knew that whatever I found out was likely to be useful in training programmes I run at a local girls' school. So, I started doing some preliminary reading, and what I found out was a mixture of the expected and the unexpected. It didn't come as all that much of a surprise to learn that male runners have more muscle and women more fat, and this accounts for most of the difference in sports performance between men and women. This is normally caused by differences in hormones. A male hormone, testosterone, builds muscle, whereas a female hormone, oestrogen, causes fat to accumulate. Of course, this was something that we learnt about very early on in sports science. But then I began reading about the nature of muscle, and this is where I found something that did surprise me. Men and women have exactly the same type of muscle fibres which means that they are capable of fuel burning at the same rate. I was also reading some very interesting research on differences between the average height of men and women. We all know, of course, that men are much taller on average than women, but what this means is that women actually work much harder because they have to take a lot more strides to cover the same distance. I hadn't understood that before I read this research. So, I set up my own small-scale research project to investigate some of these points and a few others. I asked for men and women volunteers from the university running club, and I timed their speed in a race. Then I worked out proportions by dividing a person's running time by their height. 
and what I found was that by this measure, men were only slightly ahead of the women. For my second experiment, I put weights on the men's shoulders, so that the men and women would have the same height to weight ratio. I found that under these conditions, the women actually ran faster than the men. In my last experiment, I decided to look at what is called elasticity by measuring how high the men and women could jump, and I found that my male and female participants had equal levels of jump power. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.